In this video, we're going to look at the derivatives and antiderivatives of log functions. So let's start with derivatives. Suppose that I have um, y equals the natural log of x, and we want a formula for dy by dx. Well, let's write it in the equivalent exponential form, x equals e to the power of y. And let's differentiate both sides with respect to x. Now, on the left-hand side, the derivative of x is just 1. On the right-hand side, I'll have to do use implicit differentiation. The derivative of e to the y would just be e to the y, but then the derivative of the inside, the derivative of what is inside the exponent, derivative of y is dy dx. So solving for dy dx, I'm just going to get uh, 1 over e to the y, but e to the y is the same as x. So my derivative of e to the x, I mean, sorry, of natural log of x is 1 over x. So let's find the slope of the tangent line to y equals the natural log of x squared plus 1 at the point 2 comma natural log of 5. So finding the derivative, well, it would be 1 over x squared plus 1, but I see I have to use the chain rule because inside I have a function of x, so the derivative of the inside is 2x. So let's go ahead and evaluate that when x equals 2, and I'll get 4 fifths. Here's a little bit more involved question. We'd like to find the values of x where the natural log of tangent of x minus 1 fourth cosine of 2x has a tangent line with slope 17 over 4. Now, when you get to these questions with log functions, because we have so many properties of logs, we really have a lot of options. Uh, I didn't do it this way, but I could have changed tangent of x as into sine of x over cosine of x, and then uh, use the properties of logs before I took the derivative. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it as natural log of tangent of x and go ahead and take its derivative. So 1 over tangent x, that's the derivative of the outside, times the derivative of the inside, the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. In the second term, I'm just taking the derivative of cosine of 2x. Derivative of cosine would be negative sine, so that's why I get a plus sign now. When I use the chain rule, I have a multiplier of 2, and 2 times 1 fourth gives me 1 half. So let's go ahead and clean up this expression where I have secant squared over tangent of x. I'm going to change everything to sine and cosine now. And so what's going to happen? One of the cosines is going to divide out. And I'll be left with sine of x times cosine of x. And that should be related to sine of 2x. Remember that sine of 2x is 2 sine of x times cosine of x. So sine of x times cosine of x is just half sine of 2x, which I already have there. So now I have this equation 1 over half sine of 2x plus 1 half sine of 2x. And I want to set that equal to 17 over 4 and solve for x. So um, there's a lot of ways you could go about this as well. I'm going to start by clearing the fractions, so I'm going to go ahead and multiply every term on both sides of the equation by 1 half sine of 2x. So in the first term, I'll just get a 1. In the second term, I'll have 1 half sine of 2x times itself, so that's 1 fourth sine squared 2x. And then I'll have a 17 over 4 times half sine of 2x, that gives me 17 over 8 times sine of 2x. 
So I didn't really clear the fraction. I just still have this fraction, uh, fractional coefficients. So I'm going to multiply this now times eight on both sides. Every term gets multiplied by eight. So eight times one will be eight. Eight times one fourth, that'll give me two sine squared two X. And then that'll equal uh, 17 sine of two X. Uh, this is a quadratic equation in sine of 2x. So let's make it equal to 0. And it turns out that we can factor this. We can go ahead and factor that as 2 sine of 2x minus 1 times sine of 2x minus 8. Let's just check that. By using some FOIL, I can see that I'll get the first term as 2 sine squared 2x. The last term is going to be plus 8. So the middle term, I'll have a minus 16 minus 1 together. That makes minus 17 times sine of 2x. So using the zero property of real numbers, that says that sine of 2x equals 1 half or sine of 2x equals 8. Now, sine, the range of sine is between negative 1 and positive 1. So there's no way sine of 2x can equal 8. No solution comes from that part. What about over here? Well, I need to think, you know, for what angles is the sine of an angle equal to 1 half on my unit circle? Well, that happens in the first quadrant and then the second quadrant. So in the first quadrant, uh, I would have pi over 6, and of course, plus 2 pi k. In the second quadrant, it's 5 pi over 6. Now, if I divide this uh, by 2, I'll get pi over 12 plus uh, pi k. I had to divide both terms by 2. And just a quick check back into the original uh, equation here. Tangent of pi over 6 is a positive number, so that solution would be in the domain of the original equation. What about the angle that's in the second quadrant. Well, after I divide it by 2, I'll get 5 pi over 12, still in the second quadrant. Tangent of any angle in the second quadrant is negative. So I'm going to have to reject this solution because it's not in the domain of the original equation. Tangent of 5 pi over 12 is not defined. All right. What about, um, here's another example. We'd like to find the derivative. And uh, there's two ways we can go about this. One way is we could just start with the calculus. So we have 1 over e to the x plus x e to the x. Then I'll have to use the chain rule, which means I have to take the derivative on the inside. And in my second term, I'll have to use the product rule. Now I can clean this up. I can collect the like terms and factor out e to the power of x from the numerator and from the denominator. So I get a nice common factor and it cleans up to be 2 plus x over 1 plus x. But as I said, when you're dealing with logs, you usually have a lot of options. And so another option would be to factor out the e to the x inside the input to the log, and then use a property of logs, where I could say, oh, since I have a product on the inside, I could write that as the sum of logs. And this simplifies even further because the natural log is the inverse of e to the x. So the natural log of e to the x is just x. So now I did all of that algebra, or used the property of logs up front. Now let's take the derivative. So it's a much simpler derivative, and this is a fine uh, derivative. There is no reason for us to do any more work. But to just show that I get the same answer as I did in the first method, let's write it as a single fraction. So. 1 is the same as 1 plus x over itself. Now I've got a common denominator. Combine the like terms, and sure enough, I get the same answer. 2 plus x over 1 plus x.
All right, so now let's look at this function, the natural log of the absolute value of x. So then this is going to be defined, this function f of x is defined for all numbers except x equals 0. And whenever you have an absolute value in your function definition, you could rewrite that as a piecewise defined function. So you'll have two branches, one for when the input to the absolute value is positive, and the other branches when it's negative. So when x is positive, that just gives me the natural log of x. When x is negative, then I would be taking the natural log of the absolute, I'm sorry, the opposite of x. Because when uh, x is negative, the absolute value of x is the opposite of x to make it a positive number. Well, if I write it this way, now I could go ahead and take the derivative of each branch to find the derivative of f. Well, the branch where x is positive is straightforward. That's just going to be 1 over x. Now, if x is negative, I can still use the same differentiation formula. But since I have negative x as my input, I need to apply the chain rule. So I'll take 1 over negative x. That's the derivative of the outside. The derivative of negative x is negative 1. And when I apply the chain rule and multiply that out, I get the same answer I did in the first branch. So whether x is positive or x is negative, the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x is 1 of x, 1 over x. So that means I have the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. If 1 over x is the derivative of the natural log of absolute value of x, then the antiderivative of 1 over x must be the natural log of the absolute value of x plus some constant. So in other words, the indefinite integral of 1 over x dx is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And now we've really completed uh, our power rule. If I have the, the antiderivative of x to the power of n, well, if n is not equal to negative 1, I just add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. But if n is equal to negative 1, I can't use do that operation. That's not defined. But now I know that is the natural log of the absolute value of x. So now we can really uh, solve uh, a lot of integrals that we couldn't before. So let's try to evaluate this integral, find the antiderivative of 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 all over 6x squared. So I'll just do some algebra and I'll divide 6x squared into each term. I'll do a little bit more algebra and write 1 over 3x as 1 third times 1 over x. 1 over 6x squared, I'll write that as 1 sixth x times uh, to the power of negative 2. Now for the first term and the last term, I can just use my power rule for antiderivatives. And now I've learned that the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. And now I actually have the tools to find the antiderivative of tangent of x and cotangent of x. Let's start with tangent of x. I can write that as sine of x over cosine of x. And now let's make a u substitution. I'll let u equals cosine of x, and then du is negative sine of x. And so whenever you see that the, you have a fraction and the top is really the derivative of the bottom, that should remind you of this natural log. So when I write that integral in terms of u, I'll have a negative sign that comes from the negative sine of x dx, but negative integral of 1 over u du, which we now know is 
minus natural log absolute value of u. And that's the one thing that we really have to emphasize and remember these absolute value signs. And so then uh, let's replace u with what our substitution was, cosine of x. And this is a fine antiderivative for tangent, but we normally don't remember it this way. It's really more of a memory aid, but it's sometimes useful. We know that the derivative of tangent of x can be written in terms of secant of x. Derivative of tangent of x is secant squared x. It would be nice to write its antiderivative in terms of secant of x as well. And we can do that because remember, we have a log property that says that if we take the reciprocal of the input to the log, it's changes it just changes the sign of the output. So if I, instead of having the absolute value of cosine of x, I have the absolute value of one over cosine of x, that changes the sign out in front from negative to positive. And one over cosine of x is secant of x. So the antiderivative tangent of x is the natural log of the absolute value of secant of x plus c. Now, I'll, I can do the exact same method with cotangent of x. Uh, now my u will be sine of x. And so I won't have a negative when I take the derivative of sine of x or the du. So I'll just get natural log of the absolute value of sine x plus c, which again, is a perfectly fine antiderivative of cotangent of x. But for the same reason, we know that the derivative of cotangent of x is cosecant squared of x. So let's write the antiderivative of cotangent of x in terms of cosecant. So I'm going to do the same operation I'm going to take the reciprocal of the inside. That'll change the sign on the outside. It'll make it negative. And then one over sine of x is cosecant of x. So again, this kind of helps us remember the derivative cotangent x is negative cosecant squared of x. The antiderivative cotangent of x is negative natural log of the absolute value of cosecant of x plus c. And we can use the same idea to find an antiderivative of secant of x as well. So let's think about this first. The derivative of secant of x is secant x tangent x. The derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. So if I were to take the derivative of the sum, secant of x plus tangent of x, well, I would get secant x tangent x plus secant squared x. I'd have a common factor of secant. And when I factor out that secant of x inside, I have the same thing I was taking the derivative of. So if I solve this for secant of x, secant of x is a fraction where the top is the derivative of the bottom. And so whenever we have a fraction where the top is the derivative of the bottom, we should be thinking about the antiderivative of 1 over u du. And so if I were to make that u substitution, if u were equal to secant of x tangent of x, then the antiderivative of secant of x could be written as the antiderivative of 1 over u du, where u equals secant of x plus tangent of x, which of course is the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. So the antiderivative of secant of x is the natural log of the sum secant of x plus tangent of x plus c. So finally, what if we have a base which is not e? I mean, all of our formulas for derivatives and integrals so far involve 
either the natural exponential function or the natural log. So what if I want to find something like the derivative of y equals 2 to the x? Well, really all I need is some properties of logs and exponents uh, because the natural log is the inverse of the natural exponent, exponential function, then e to the natural log of 2 is just 2. So instead of writing 2 to the x, I could write this using this property. So 2 to the power of x would be e to the natural log of 2, all raised to the power of x. But now let's use a property of exponents and write that as e to the natural log of 2 times x. Well, now I can take the derivative of this expression. If I take the derivative of that expression, uh, it's just going to be e to the natural log of 2x, and then apply the chain rule. What's the derivative of the inside? What's inside the exponent? Natural log of 2 times x. That's just a constant times x. So the derivative is just the constant natural log of 2. Now, let's change it back to our original form of 2 to the power of x. So now I can see that the derivative of b to the power of x is just b to the power of x times natural log of b. So if you remember when we first explored derivatives of exponentials, we said that an interesting property that we got from the definition is that the derivative of an exponential function is proportional to the original function. And now we know that constant of proportionality is just the natural log of the base. And then we could use that to find the antiderivative is still just going to be the original function now divided by the natural log of the base. And of course, plus c. So, Let's work out a couple of examples. Let's find an equation of the tangent line to this exponential function, y equals 2 to the power of x squared minus 2 at the point 2 comma 4. So take the derivative. I'll have to use the chain rule. So the derivative of the outside is 2 to the power of x squared minus 2 times natural log of 2. Now apply the chain rule. The derivative of x squared minus 2 is 2x. So I'm not even going to clean that up because I'm going to go ahead and evaluate that when x equals 2. So I already know that when x equals 2, y should equal 4 here. So just to check, 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 2 is 2. 2 raised to the power of 2 is, of course, 4. Now over here, I have to multiply that times another 4, and then multiply that times natural log of 2 to get 16 natural log of 2. So here it just says write an equation. So I'm going to go ahead and write an equation in point slope form. y minus 4 equals 16 natural log of 2. That's my slope in parentheses x minus 2. And our last example is to evaluate this integral. I have 10 to the power of x dx. My bounds go from 0 to 1. So the antiderivative of 10 to the power of x is just going to be 10 to the power of x divided by natural log of 10. And I'll need to evaluate that between 0 and 1. So 10 to the power of 1 is just 10. 10 to the 0 power is 1 is 1. Make sure I said that right. 10 to the power of 1 is just 10. Subtract off 10 to the power of 0. 10 to the power of 0 is 1. So 10 minus 1 will give me 9 over natural log of 10.